I'm going to talk on a very, very specific and, in my opinion, slightly understudied duty of uh, online service providers. And I think it is understudied because it is mistaken as just one of these other relatively boring compliance duties. Um, these sort of things that if you are not really working in the field or if you are not running that sort of business, you just ignore because nothing really interesting is going on. And I disagree with that. I think something extremely interesting and problematic is going on here. And I, I hope to convince you um, that it is difficult and, and convincing and needs uh, further attention. Um, normally, if I address an audience like that, very mixed audience, different backgrounds, I try to start with something, my normal opening, uh, that, that tries to make it relevant for everyone. So I would ask, have you ever received spam or have you ever been hacked? And I wanted to ask, have your details been leaked after uh, Ashley Madison was hacked? But then I realized that might not be the most appropriate question to, to ask, uh, given the circumstances. Now, you've all heard about uh, the, the case or the, the problem. Uh, massive uh, online uh, service platform was hacked. Uh, they were in the business of facilitating extramarital affairs, obviously causing quite a lot of distress to lots of people. I think apparently by now suicides have happened as a result of that. So a really, really serious problem. And we learned about that because the hackers actually were there first. They put it on uh, online. And that raises the question whether, and apart from having uh, insufficient security. Ashley Madison also fell foul of the various security breach notification laws um, enacted for the first time in 2002 in California. They were the first country or the first state to, to have uh, such a duty imposed. Other American states followed very quickly on and I think by now almost all of them have a specific security breach notification law. In 2009 the European Union added it uh, into the Directive on Privacy and Electronic Communication. Uh, Germany implemented it amongst other countries. Um, Germany, it's Article 42 of the Bundesdatenschutzgesetz. And uh, very, very recently, uh, President Obama has called for a, a federal security breach notification law in addition to the state security breach notification laws. So what are that type of laws? What do they actually require? Um, let's look at the European case. It's essentially uh, they create a duty to inform in the case of a security breach where sensitive personal data was lost and some other categories of data such as um, uh, data protected by professional privilege and, 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 and some others. Immediately, and we don't quite know what immediately here means, it's not just, it is not necessary that you know for a fact that a security breach happened. Um, something less, but how much less is I think rather unclear. Could be a reasonable suspicion, might be on the balance of probabilities, difficult to say. Um, but without jeopardizing police investigation, which is an interesting question because how do you know as an OSP how police investigation works? And you can ask, obviously, and ask, is that okay? But that might get you into problems with immediately, depending on how fast the uh, police responds to that type of request. Um, comprehensive and complete, yet useful and with advice on how to minimize harm. And I think, again, these two provisions potentially contradict each other. I mean, the best way of uh, doing something totally useless is to dr uh, drown someone in information. You might remember that from the Yes Minister episodes. Uh, what does a civil servant do if he wants to uh, neutralize his minister? He just gives him all the reports and all the data, and then he can be totally sure that nothing is going to happen, most certainly uh, nothing useful. So that, in a nutshell, are, are the information duties that uh, that provision creates. Now, I should be careful here from feedback I've received when I gave this previously. I'm actually not against this type of provision. I think they have a rule to play. I think they could probably be, be drafted slightly differently. Um, when I'm saying in the rest of the talk that we need to think much, much more careful before we impose that sort of duty. That shouldn't mean that I'm against imposing it, but I think we need a different type of discourse uh, be before we are doing it. Um, oh, yes, uh, that uh, uh, as well, a duty very often to inform a relevant authority and the affected customers. So it's a two-way communication here. 
Um, that is a European version. Quite a number of US states do it slightly differently. They also have this duty, but it only is triggered if you are not security certified. So it becomes a stick that you use on those companies that have failed to undertake a voluntary security assessment previously. So you don't make the security assessment mandatory by law. You say, well, if you want to play uh, fast and loose with your data, be our guest. But if something goes wrong, uh, then additional duties are triggered. So th that's a different, slightly different structure from, from the European um, version. Now, I think there are three things we ought to be doing, or four things we ought to be doing about this law. Uh, we just started with this project, so I can't give you a lot of uh, insights yet. Um, I think they require a, a much better conceptual analysis. They also require a different type of empirical evaluation. I will only talk very, very briefly on that. Uh, we know amazingly little on what good this type of law does and who uses that information and for what purpose. There might also be a candidate for good computational implementation, so extracting the logical structure and seeing uh, how we may be able to assist companies in actually complying with that sort of rule. Now, why do I think that these laws are quite amazing and, requ and requiring much, much deeper philosophical thought and, and public debate? Um, I think there are two principles at stake here, two principles of justice, one famous and recognized problematic and one maybe more hidden that are affected by this. Firstly, these laws prima facie create an exception to the right against self-incrimination. Um, Ashley Madison very likely is going to face uh, lawsuits both from uh, citizens, from, from customers that have been affected, but maybe also uh, a criminal uh, 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 prosecutions. Um, if they have to <coughs> inform people about that, then this could be constructed as uh, acceptance of uh, liability. Now, that has been recognized, and there are provisions in the law that ought to make it impossible to use the uh, notification process in evidence. How that is supposed to work in practice, nobody knows, because um, it is rather difficult to unthink something or to forget something that you know. And whenever a judge in a jury trial says, the jury will disregard the latest comment, uh, that's cause for a chuckle, I would say, because it just doesn't work. And there's lots of empirical data that shows that these um, instructions to not to ignore something that you know are uh, having the exact opposite effect. They, they remind you that there was something that you were supposed to ignore rather than actually ignoring it. So a pretty basic and important principle of uh, the trial, the right against self-incrimination, potentially is violated here. But I think there's a much, much more worrisome aspect here, which is sometimes hidden because we don't like OSSs like Ashley Madison, which is a particularly bad example, but, but we don't feel particularly strong sympathy to them and to their plight when they uh, get hacked. I mean, our immediate gut reaction is, oh, these bastards doing terrible things with our data. But technically speaking, they are the victim here. They are the victim of a crime. And normally, we are extremely reluctant to impose additional duties on victims of crime. It is very, very rare to find any other form of law that has that structure. You get something like Nichtanzeigen einer Straftat in German law, non-reporting of a crime. Uh, you get some provisions under the Anti-Terrorism Act in, in the UK, but they are always prospective. They only come in if a crime can still be prevented. And there you can make a good policy argument that if it costs you relatively little, just picking up the phone and informing people, you can prevent actual harm occurring to third parties, you might make a strong argument, uh, civic duty argument, that that is perfectly legitimate. But this is not the situation here. Here, in a way, the harm has happened. The crime has happened. It is, it is uh, after the event. So the only other type of um, situation which comes close to it, we think, or I think, is in the field of uh, domestic abuse prosecutions. Because there the police for a very long time faced the problem that the victim very often was not willing to press charges or to, they, they withdrew their statements. So there are a couple of worrying, contested, problematic cases, both in the UK and US, the jurisdictions I looked at, um, where a woman, for instance, was prosecuted after she withdrew a truthful statement about the abuse by her partner after prosecution has started. 
So the typical situation was she made an accusation, she put it in writing. It was a truthful accusation that during the trial she suddenly evoked her, her spousal privilege and withdrew the original statement. And she was prosecuted for that. That's a, it's an English case. Because, well, contempt of court, uh, perverting the course of justice, there are enough reasonably wide provisions available uh, to, to make that sort of charge stick. Very, very contested, very problematic, lots of debate around it. Uh, and here you could say, in a way, the situation is more straightforward because the trial had already started. The public had invested in this prosecution. Harm was done to the taxpayer, for instance, if now suddenly everything falls to pieces again. So you could say by making the truthful statement initially, she had accepted a certain type of duty. Uh, her, her, her normative position had changed. In a way, that's not the case here. Uh, in the way, that's not the case in um, uh, the security breach notification duties. So I think even though the, the victims are not the most likable of victims, that shouldn't deter us from uh, thinking, is that a good idea? That would be the exact analogy, exactly. When they already, when, when the state already acted on uh, the information and took actions at a cost to the public purse, you, you might say, I'm not, I'm not necessarily pressing that line of argument, but you might say there's a small normative difference between the case where you prosecute someone who in open trial withdraws a previously made statement uh, and someone who never made that statement in the first place. And uh, so that is the, 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 the possible, possible way of distinguishing the two cases. If you don't want to make that distinction, that's perfectly fine by me. But that would still be the only clear analogy to, to security breach notification uh, duties. And as I said, they have been extremely controversially debated in the criminological literature. Was that a good idea? Was that fair? Was, was, was that just? Um, shouldn't a victim have to control? Over, over the trial. After all, the trial is for the victim, isn't it? And if the victim says, I don't want that, then that should be well within their rights. One could argue. I think that's a wrong argument, but that is a, a possible argument that needs to be discussed. Well, the problem is that issues like that cannot even be discussed, I think, uh, within the traditional jurisprudential framework. For a interesting uh, reason, um, that might have to, to rethink some, some really traditional, very influential legal theory as a consequence. If we think of the sort of three most influential large-scale legal theorists of the 20th, well, late 19th and then 20th century, Austin, Hart, and Kelson, if you think about how they perceive the relation between law and citizen, in particular criminal law and citizen, it's always a one-way communication. You have the legislator on top, the sovereign on top, and he talks down to the citizen. The citizen is told what not to do. It's a very clear, straightforward, one-way communication. With Hart, there is a sort of intermediary, the officials, so the um, legislator doesn't even make his hands dirty. He tells the police and the judges to do their bidding. But again, the citizen is at the receiving end and only at the receiving end. And Kelson has an even more sophisticated version of that where people talk down within a hierarchy uh, potentially or an administrative hierarchy. But again, it is talking down, if you like, one flow of the uh, communication from the legislator to the citizen. Now, in a democratic society, there would be a sort of comeback in the form of participation in the legislative process, but that is bracketed out here. Um, neither of these theorists say any, says anything about democratic participation that would work just as well for uh, any run of the mill dictatorship. And um, Luke Wintgens in his work on Dutch's Prudence has given some historical reasons why that would be the case and why legal theory doesn't concern itself with the lawmaking process. So we are ended, ended up with that sort of uh, top-down talking towards citizens. And you could say that that doesn't even capture in a traditional legal system all that is going on. Because there are other things that we expect in operating a justice system which are not just 
the legislator telling the citizen what to do. In common law countries, most iconically, for instance, we have jury duties. Now, how does that fit into a hard, you know, an Austinian framework? Where I, as a citizen, not as an official, but I, as a citizen, have a duty to provide certain types of information about community standards, for instance, as part of the trial. Very difficult even to, to think about these things. So uh, some legal theorists, and in particular Anthony Duff and, and Sandra Marshall, they said, well, this is a big problem here. That doesn't even capture the reality of uh, our, our existing legal system. There are certain things that just don't fit in here. And they see it as primarily a question of theory of criminal law, maybe chronological theory. I think they may have very valuable insights, but they do not frame it in information terms. And I think they would benefit greatly in uh, rethinking what they are doing in information terms. Whereas I think some of these things are exactly what Luciano predicted in a way in his uh, uh, book on information ethics, that certain types of defenses, roles, uh, excuses become contested in an information environment but you never quite uh, went to the detail of specific criminal laws, which they do. So I think the combination could work. And what we get is justice to zero, user-generated content. Uh, what is a justice system in which the citizen is not just at the receiving end, but plays an active participatory role? And can we think of that in, in ethical terms? Um, with that, I think what is, we can, we, we can, we, we, we can sort of, Give, give the project a, a, a hypothesis or a, a question, what is the role of criminal law in a democratic republic, a community of free and equal citizens? So assuming that we are living in that sort of state, assuming, which is a big assuming, that we have good reasons to agree on the substantive law. It is our law, it is common law in that sense that we agreed as a uh, policy, polity um, to be governed by these rules. What are, what is exactly our relation, what is our duty towards the administration of the criminal justice process? Um, there are three um, sort of legal theorist stuff I mentioned already. Um, our criminal law should be participatory and deliberative, or is participatory and deliberative. Having public trials is not just to determine a sanction, it is a public deliberative process in which the state explains to all the citizens what is going on. And the citizens participate in it, for instance, through things like jury duty or by being a witness or by contributing in other forms. Um, Dworkin's uh, idea of a criminal law that is driven by equal concern and respect. Um, if I'm a victim of a crime, I'm still on the one hand protected by equal concern and respect, but I also owe it to my, my other fellow citizens. And Petit, uh, the eyeball test, uh, look others in the eye without reason for the fear or deference that a power of interference might inspire. Uh, the, the, the liberty, the ability to talk freely, even about harmful things, things harmful to you, part of, of an important element of a, broadly speaking, communitarian view of uh, the criminal justice system. And one thing we can do as sort of building blocks, and I won't come to the computational part, I just realized, is to say, well, law is not just about officials. Uh, there is not just a tripartite division between legislator, officials, and uh, citizens. There are different ways in which we can relate to individual crimes. Being a police officer, being an investigator is only one of them. Um, we also have lay officials and jurors, citizens who take on voluntarily specific roles, are not paid, they are not officials in, in the heart and sense. Uh, they might have a duty even to do that, might not be by choice, but they all come with specific information duties. Um, the jury traditionally was an information gathering device. The purpose of the jury was, go back to your village, tell me, king, what is going on. Um, the passive jury is, is a much later uh, in, in invention. Um, we have witnesses, people who relate to a crime because they saw what was happening and then have the duty to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And we have victims. And victims of crime might play a specific role. Suspects, convicts, and ex-convicts. They are sort of very broad first 
a step at this. These all seem to be relevant ways in which citizens can relate or be related to a specific crime. And each of them, I would say, comes with a different set of information, duties, and rights. Certain things you need not say, and certain things you should say, and maybe even must say. And we should also distinguish aspirational duties. It would be good if every citizen looked out after each other and we helped each other more, but we might not want to make that a legal duty. So we might want to distinguish also the aspirational from the um, from the legal here. And I think with that, these, this is sort of minimal cr parts to even ask the question, what sort of duties should we have of victims? What, what is legitimate uh, to ask of a victim of a crime to participate? And in that view, uh, crimes would be public wrongs. They are not just between the perpetrator and the victim. There is a much more categorical difference between criminal law and private law in that respect. Um, if I suffer from a crime, then it's not just between me and the perpetrator. But there are societal interests at stake here. It's a uh, public, publicly holding to account that suddenly uh, becomes a matter. And with that, it becomes legitimate to impose, for instance, on the victim, potentially, um, certain types of participator, participatory duties. Now, I wrap this up very quickly. I don't say anything about how they are used empirically. Just um, a little bit on the computational side. A long time ago, well, a few years ago, we were involved in a project that analyzed miscarriages of justice and what the main source for miscarriages of justice is. And one of the main sources was non-disclosure of information by the police to the defense. Not malicious non-disclosure. It was not withholding an alibi or something quite as dramatic. It was not understanding how a defense solicitor would build their case and therefore typically not disclosing information that pointed at other potential perpetrators. And if you think back to the, to the slide uh, without jeopardizing the information duty, without jeopardizing police investigation, it's exactly that sort of swap that you see the case from the other side that was not possible or very difficult for the police to do. So we looked at ways of uh, improving police disclosure duties through a appropriate logical framework. And one of the things we could say here, an analogy is, the police didn't disclose this duty because it was in a way contrary to their interests. They wanted a conviction. They were nonetheless forced to disclose something that might harm them. Similar here, the companies don't want to disclose this. They are forced to do it for the public good, for the greater good, for the integrity of the, the justice system. So by seeing these two types of duties, communication duties in parallel, we might be able to extract the logical structure behind this, the same way as, as, as we did for the police. And very, very quickly to, to um, finish that, there's another communication duty, uh, the duty of the witness to the jury to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You remember the mix between completeness and um, efficacy of communication. That is also a duty we impose on witnesses. And one of the things we want to do is to find out, working with philosophers who have experience in the theory of science, how these whole truth operators look like, uh, what we mean by the whole truth, which is more or different from the truth. And there are some ways in, in theory of science, by David Armstrong amongst others, to give a sort of rigorous formal account of that. We think that is necessary to actually be able to understand what exactly it is that we're imposing on the victims. And with that, the question of whether it is legitimate to impose a sort of duty on the victims. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you.